our last discussion was till question 21, chapter 2, Sigmund Freud. In this series of FAQ psychoanalysis, we are into second chapter of Sigmund Freud. We completed 20 questions. In the remaining 15 questions of this chapter, and with that, this chapter of Sigmund Freud will complete in this lecture. Question 21. Why dreams are so important for psychoanalysis? Because Freud used to say dreams are the royal road to the unconscious. Dream is a wholesale excavation of the unconscious. In contrast to revelation in retail as it happens with other tools of psychoanalysis. Dream and art, especially visual art, they are wholesale excavations of the unconscious. Difficulty is the unconscious speaks in a language of disguise and therefore it has to be decoded to understand the meaning. Dreams therefore need to be analyzed and dream analysis or dream interpretation gives us and a wholesale excess, not a comprehensive excess, but a wholesale excess into the unconscious. Instead of looking into the unconscious through the keyhole, we now have one window open. All windows can never be open, should not be open, but one window is now open. Compared to retail investigation, we are into a wholesale excavation of the unconscious. So dreams are very important. One good dream analyzed is equal to 15 good sessions of therapy. Psychoanalytic psychotherapy therefore places a great importance on interpretation of dreams. Freud wrote a complete book, Interpretation of Dreams, 1900. Same dream can be interpreted using Freudian method, using Jungian method, using cohesion method, and the same dream is interpreted differently by each school of psychoanalysis. The craft and the capability and the expertise of dream analysis lies in the fact which school to use, when and how much. In the same dream, we may have to use the Freudian approach, the Kleinian approach, the Kaushan approach. If you are interested in details, read my book, Dream Analysis, in which the same dream is analyzed using different schools of psychoanalysis. You can see how it is done. What is dream work? Dream work is the work of disguise. If there is an unacceptable desire or fear in the unconscious, the unconscious does not allow it to just come up like that. At the repression barrier, the forces of repression are acting downwards and there is a customs office at the repression barrier. And the only way a difficult thing can pass that barrier and go into the dream is by undergoing adequate disguise. This disguise is called the dream work. It is the work of disguising the real content of the unconscious. The real difficult content, which may be a difficult desire or a difficult fear or any other thing which is difficult, 
that is called the latent content. And the dream that we see is called manifest dream. The latent content cannot come directly up. What comes up is manifest content. So the latent content undergoes a disguise, comes to the repression barrier, repression barrier checks it, and when it realizes that, when it is satisfied that if adequate disguise has been done, the person, the conscious mind cannot make out the meaning of this dream, cannot make out the real latent content, only then the repression barrier allows this dream to pass through. The work of dream interpretation or dream analysis is to undo the disguise. It is opposite of dream work and that is done using principles of dream analysis. So question 23, what is interpretation of dreams? It is to decode the dream. It is to strip the dream of the dream work strip the dream of all the disguises so we can come to the latent content, the real heart of the dream. Interpretation of dreams is the journey, intellectual journey from dream manifest to the latent content of the dream. And of course, for that we'll require free association related to every element in the dream by the dreamer, given by the dreamer, not his I mean, we need the dreamers' free associations, not our free associations. We also need discussion with the dreamer because often multiple interpretations can seem feasible. It's only the discussion with the dreamer that helps us to eliminate the non-relevant and come to the real interpretation. What is narcissism? There are two meanings as we discussed. Primary narcissism is a stage of oceanic oneness. Whereas usually what is called narcissism is secondary narcissism. And uh, this happens when the approach of the child to relate to the mother or important figures in his life is not reciprocated, is frustrated. The child develops a immature, premature and a pathological self-sufficiency and a template never again to relate deeply to anybody. This is called secondary narcissism or narcissism. The key features are grandiosity, a false sense of self-sufficiency, inability to take criticism, fragility, often a tinge of perversion and exploitation. Twenty-five, what is Freudian understanding about obsessions and compulsions? Obsessions and compulsions are ways to channelize and bind anxiety. Anxiety is being generated somewhere for some reason and the system decides to bind that anxiety into an obsession or a compulsion. So obsessions and compulsions are derivative problems. The core problem is anxiety. Obsessions means repetitive intrusive thoughts in the mind and compulsion means repetitive intrusive actions. Some people can have only obsessions, some can have only compulsions, some can have both obsessions and compulsions. Obsessions are repetitive intrusive thoughts outside of our control and compulsions are obsessive, uh, repetitive intrusive actions out of our control. Freudian analysis is this, that the Oedipal resolution has not happened because of which 
the castration anxiety is very high and one source of anxiety is the castration anxiety. In fact, that is the major source of anxiety. So because of non-resolution of the Oedipus complex, anxiety is being generated and somehow the person is because of severe non-resolution of the Oedipus complex and too much of castration anxiety and too little other sources of pleasure, the person is regressing back to the anal phase where repetition is incurred. And it is the anxiety from the Oedipal phase and the regression to the anal phase where repetition happens. And based upon what did not go well in the anal phase, that is chosen by this anxiety to be used as an anchor for obsessions and compulsions. So the healing is to resolve the Oedipus. 26. How do we explain bisexuality and homosexuality? Based on the Oedipus complex. The Oedipus complex we talked about was the heterosexual Oedipus complex, erotic feelings towards parents of the opposite gender. In case of a homosexual constitution, the Oedipus will be reversed. There will be erotic feelings towards parent of the same gender and death wish for parent of the opposite gender. And in case of bisexuality, sorry, yeah, in case of bisexuality, there will be both of it. There will be erotic feelings towards both the parents and death wish towards both the parents. Usually when we say Oedipus complex, we refer to the heterosexual Oedipus complex. If it's a homosexual Oedipus complex, we call it the Electra complex or the negative Oedipus complex. Twenty-seven. What does Freud say about civilized? What's a, what does Freud say in his paper? Civilization in its discontents. In this paper, a very famous paper, Civilization in its discontents. Freud says that civilization is built upon control of desire, control of the frustration of desire, and this is not a small cost to pay and therefore the individual is always on the edge because every moment he has to repress, suppress his desires for the sake of civilization. And while the cost benefit analysis of this is definitely positive and civilization is better than its alternative, the fact remains that it is not easy to bear the discontents and the frustrations of civilization. And these discontents and frustrations build up with brick by brick. And when it becomes an explosive critical mass, it explodes either at the individual level or at the collective level. And therefore, this occasional explosions of aggression, of sexuality, of the immoral elements in civilization, it is, Freud says, inevitable because at the root are unbridled, infinite, ceaseless drives seeking satisfaction. And we have no way of really transforming or pacifying or removing these drives. We can only suppress or repress and both of these have their limitations. And occasionally, therefore, it is natural that explosions, immoral, brutal explosions, animalistic explosions will be happening in civilization. 28. In fact, uh, Einstein wrote a very famous paper, a famous letter to Freud in Second World War because both were Jews and both had seen Holocaust at very close quarters. Freud writes to Einstein, Einstein wrote to Freud as to why human beings are so violent and brutal. 
And Freud says that the primary forces of aggression and sadism we have not been able to handle till now, despite all the advances in science, and that remains a insolvable problem. And if this problem is not solved, aggression, brutality, domination, sadism cannot be stopped in human civilization. And Freud was very pessimistic about it. He did not envision any way that the core problems of aggression, destruction, brutality, sadism can be solved. Twenty-eight. What is the central idea in Freud's paper, Beyond the Pleasure Principle? Beyond the Pleasure Principle is a very important paper because Freud takes a turn. It's a dark era moment for Freud. We see this in most intellectuals in their lifelong journey. The later intellectual is very different from the early intellectual in terms of some of the conceptual beliefs. We see this in case of Freud, in case of Heidegger, in case of Lacan. So early Freud and late Freud are very different. Early Heidegger and late Heidegger are very different. Early Wittgenstein and late Wittgenstein are very different. Early Lacan and late Lacan are different. Same phenomena we see in Freud. Early Freud and late Freud. Late Freud, early Freud was a pleasure Freud. Late Freud was a death instinct Freud. And beyond the pleasure principle opens up this area where Freud says that human beings not only are pleasure seekers, but there is also a death instinct, a death instinct at work. Not only a pleasure instinct, but also a death instinct at work. The death instinct has to do with uh, seeking pleasure in suffering, seeking pleasure in destruction of the other, seeking pleasure in self-destruction. And this turns upside down what is pleasure. We will have to define happiness instead of pleasure and say happiness comes from something pleasurable as we usually understand it and also from something destructive which is not pleasurable from usual standards. So either we define happiness to talk about general pleasure and death instinct pleasure or life instinct pleasure and death instinct pleasure or we define pleasure to say there is pleasure which you can derive in a healthy way through the life instinct and through a pathological way to the death instinct. But both of them will operate in some proportions. So beyond the pleasure principle, Freud says that many soldiers coming back from war, suffering from PTSD, they keep repeating those traumatic incidents, not only for mastering them bit by bit, as Freud earlier thought, but also because it gives them a secret pleasure. And there is a secret pleasure in suffering, a secret pleasure in self-destruction, a secret pleasure in destruction of the other. And this Freud talks about it beyond the pleasure principle, that we seek enjoyment even beyond the pleasure the ordinarily understood pleasure. And there is a secret pleasure even in things which are painful, suffering-giving, destructive to self or the other. And this leads to the idea of mesochism, that mesochism is not just sadism turned upside down, it is an entity independent into itself based upon the death instinct.
So in the earlier conceptualization, sadism was primary. Masochism was sadism turned upside down because sadism could not be practiced directly. Now we have another possibility also that masochism is equally primary and some forms of sadism can actually be masochism turned upside down. We can see the pleasure of uh, pain most dramatically in sexual masochism in the BDSM experiences. We can see that in self-harm. We can see that in uh, sipping very hot cups of tea or eating very spicy food. Or wearing very tight clothes. Or undergoing tattoos or piercings. of denying pleasure to oneself for a greater cause. So this is where Freud goes into beyond the pleasure principle to redefine pleasure and introduce an element of death instinct and masochism as great sources of pleasure and destruction. 29, what is death instinct? Towards the end of his life, Freud had created the third model of the mind, which is not called a model of the mind, it's actually called a concept. And the concept is, there is a life instinct and a death instinct. Life instinct he called eros, which is pleasure seeking, constructive, healthy, and a death instinct, which is pain seeking, destructive, and unhealthy. And both of them coexist. By and large, the life instinct neutralizes the death instinct. But if it is not able to, some part of the death instinct can escape and find a manifestation. Or if both of them get decoupled, then a serious crisis evolves. This concept has the full potential to make a model of the mind, which Freud could not do. Post Freudians also could not do. But I would give the respect of the third model of the mind to this concept because it has the potential to re-explain everything Freud explained before. Some people say there is no need for the death instinct. You could just say pleasure and aggression. There was no need to go into a mystical concept of a death instinct. But Freud, based upon, based his death instinct on certain philosophical foundations, and he started, of course, from observation of the patients. Observation was relishing of pain, relishing of self-destruction, relishing of destruction of the other. And a movement towards death. These were observed facts. From that, he philosophically deduced that there is a movement in the mind, a very fundamental movement, to go back to the state of inertia in matter from where we came. So, there are two forces there at work. One force which is making a movement from inertia to vibrant matter, to life, to mind. And there is a second opposing force which is pulling down the mind into life, life into matter, matter into inertia. And this force which is pulling you downwards into inertia, Freud called this instinct as the death instinct. And obviously just as an infant grows from a small child to a big man, that is the predominance of the life instinct. Then from middle ages, he starts declining into old age and dies. There's a slow predomin predomin predominance of the death instinct. I mean, if people are getting birth and growing up, life instinct, of course, is proved. And if after growing up, 
people are declining in age and dying, death instinct also is proved. And therefore, it's very easy to understand that both these forces are at work. He called the life instinct as eros and death instinct as thanatos. What is 30? Question 30, what is the project? Freud believed as a good neurologist who later on became founding father of psychoanalysis, of course, that someday psychoanalysis can be reduced to neurology, to biology. And this enterprise he termed as the project. The project was the project or a ambition to find scientific explanation based in biology for everything that we know in psychoanalysis. Of course, it remained incomplete in Freud's times, incomplete even today. It's going to be incomplete for a reasonable period of time. We are still far off from where neurology can investigate all that we know about in psychoanalysis. Question 31, was Freud psychologically healthy himself? No, not completely. Freud was neurotic for seven years of his life. He calls that period the period of splendid isolation. Just as Jung had his period of Nikia, Freud called his false period splendid isolation. He used to have convulsive hysterical fits. He used to have hypochondriacal belief that he is going to die. Um, he had his own Oedipal issues. Certain obsessions, addictions, he was never like smoking. He could never give up all his life. Certain fears he could never give up all his life. But to go by his definition, was he able to work and love, which is his definition of being healthy, being able to work and being able to love. He was a very productive man and he had a good married life. So he was able to work and love. So by his own definition, he was healthy enough. But He was not completely healthy. He had some pathologies across his life. 32. How did Freud view human nature? Freud was a pessimist, materialist. So he was a product of modernity. So his philosophical foundation were, foundations were based in Atheism, materialism, individualism, and hedonism, the four pillars of modernity. And reductionist science, sorry, five pillars of modernity. Freud was not given to spirituality or any spiritual goal. So his assessment of limitations of human potential limits of human potential was very conservative and pessimistic. He was more of a Schopenhauer and less of a Voltaire. He did not believe that a great future is awaiting humanity or there is a heavenly state to be reached on earth. He used to famously say that the goal of psychoanalysis is to make unbearable unhappiness into bearable unhappiness. Thirty-three. Is Freud today an atmosphere of opinion, uh, Walter Shaw? Yes, indeed so. Freud has been silently appropriated at 50 places in the intellectual world, mostly without acknowledging a debt to Freud. Neurology, psychiatry, psychology, sociology, film studies, art, 
anthropology, entire humanities and social sciences has been influenced by Freud. Within psychoanalysis, of course, it's a full school, one of the major schools of psychoanalysis. The expanse of Freud is both extensive and pervasive. He is not, he is no longer held to be infallible or complete, but his influence is undeniable, pervasive, deep, and even if it is a quarter fortress of a truth, it is a fortress of a truth, even though a quarter to fortress of a truth, the fundamental ideas stand strong even today. Thirty-four. What are the good resources on Freud to know more on him? Freud himself is a delight to read. He is a very good writer, but he is not an easy writer. So many people find it difficult to read him. You can start by reading a book by Anthony Storr on Sigmund Freud. It's an introductory book, a very small book. Second, you can take up an introductory book by Brenner. Then you can read Freud in the original. And then you can go to Cambridge Companion or Freud. And then you can go to research papers. This is one way to approach Freud. Today you have very good videos on YouTube to know Freud in easy language. Our endeavor also is in that area to make Freud easy to understand and start off a deeper study of Freud. 35. How is Freud seen after so many years? He is seen as one of the stalwarts in the history of human thought, in the history of ideas. Fundamental discoveries of the unconscious, the concept of the unconscious, concept of defenses, the concept of interpretation of dreams, the concept of life and death instincts, primacy of childhood, psychic determinism, the whole area of slips, psychopathology of everyday life, these have stood the test of time. Some ideas have been rejected, some are yet to be investigated fully. Some have been complimented. I would say less ideas have been rejected. Most of the ideas have been accepted. But the, the store of all ideas put together is still a small store compared to the vastness of the human mind. So, Freudian school is incomplete. Every school in psychoanalysis is incomplete. All schools of psychoanalysis put together collectively still is a very incomplete thing in the face of the largeness of the psyche. East and the West, both put together, still is incomplete. So, decades, probably a century or more of work remains to fully know the psyche. On the whole, he stands as a towering figure in the gallery of geniuses. And he has opened an area so difficult to open. It has made after that navigating in that landscape so easy for us but the most difficult thing has been done by him to open the concept of the unconscious and the concept of unconscious anchoring of psychopathology. His famous quote, we are never so defenseless against suffering as when we love. Sigmund Freud. We complete here 
chapter 2 of FAQ psychoanalysis. Obviously, each school of psychoanalysis would take three to five years to master fully. We are completing it in one and a half, two hours. So obviously, it's a concise exploration. Questions, if you have, write to me at hvindia at gmail.com. Thank you.